When Jesus had rose, uh, risen from the dead, he met with his disciples several times, and he says, I'll meet you in Galilee. So they went up to the mountains in Galilee, and he had this last section. This is the last section of your Gospel of Matthew. I just want you to listen. It's called the Great Commission, but just listen what was going on here. Then the 11 disciples went to the Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted, even at that moment, by the way. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is saying here that uh, I've given you a command to go and make disciples from all over the world. You teach them, the truths that I've given, you baptize them, you identify them, you welcome them into the family, and that's called the Great Commission. It's not the great option, it's the Great Commission. And all of us are to do that, whether we go, whether we live here in the States or whether we live somewhere else in the world, that's our commission to go do this. And we work with God in our lives. Nathan Sano Wagner have been doing this now for a number of years, but more recently they've decided to go and live in Albania. Now we've we have sent probably eight or nine teams to Albania over these years to go and, and help them. Uh, Don and I went one of those years to meet with pastors from around the country. It was an exciting time. Um, and they're gonna share their ministry. We support them as a church. And I want you to hear their heart. And they're gonna present, they're gonna show us a couple videos of what they do so you get a picture of what Albania is like. There's a ministry that goes on in the city of Albania, but there's also places in the country that they minister to. And uh, I, I know some of these people, so when I saw the preview, I got a little teary actually, because I saw some of these same faces, and I see their smiles, and I see that they've grown spiritually, which is very uh, touching to me. So they're gonna share these videos, they're gonna make a presentation, and at the end we're gonna do an interaction time. And uh, so you just jot down a couple questions you might wanna ask and we'll go from there. So, do we want to watch the first video first? Let's, it's a family video, let's watch that. Good morning, it's a joy to be with you again. As Pastor Dave said earlier, 2013 was the last time we were here, so I'm sure there's many of you, or some of you, that we haven't met before, so we 
look forward to getting to know you after the service is over. Um, before we share our update on the ministry in Albania, I wanted to ask Nathan to share a little preface of sorts, um, explaining why these types of missionary visits are not only so good for us, but for you as well. And um, we have a picture that you can see of two ancient olive trees that are going to um, just accompany a little bit of the illustration that he's going to share. One of the things that we do when we come back to the States is we have training, we have um, support from our headquarters from World Gospel Mission. They, they do a re-entry, they help us process what God's doing um, and help us in our, our family's relationship, our ministry. And as part of that training this time, I heard from an arborist from um, Oregon, actually, and uh, he, was, he was just sharing something that I had heard in elementary school, I had learned, but it, it shed new light to me, and, and I started thinking about, closer, okay, sorry, I started thinking about uh, the, this uh, as an analogy of the church, and he was talking about trees. He was talking about how leaves and roots interact. Um, and he, like I said, this is a little bit elementary school, but, I, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway because maybe you'll have an aha moment like I did. Um, a tree has roots, and depending on the type of tree and where the roots are planted, they either go way down deep to hold the tree up or they go out left and right to hold that, that tree up. Um, and that's a big part of what the roots are there for, is to hold fast the tree. But the roots aren't there just as stability. They're also there to take the nutrients from the soil and the water from the soil and push it on up towards the rest of the tree, ending up in the leaves. Well, the leaves aren't just recipients of those nutrients. They also have their own little factories. And you, you know this, the photosynthesis. They, they take the energy from the sun and they take the nutrients and water that the roots give them, and then they start producing sugars in the form of starch. Now, the, the roots are giving to the tree, and the leaves are giving to the tree. Um, but what the arborist said, and this is where it sort of stuck out to me, and I thought was really interesting, is that a healthy tree with healthy roots and healthy leaves produces more starch than is needed for the tree to survive. So what happens to that extra starch? It becomes fruit. The extra starch, when the roots are being, doing their job and the leaves are doing their job, is, root, is that fruit is produced. If either the roots don't do their job well or the leaves don't do their job well, then there isn't fruit that's produced. And I started thinking about that in the, the realm of missions and the church. And I, I see churches as trees planted in a community. This church, Calvary Bible, is planted in Rutland, Vermont. Your roots go deep here. They, they're strong here. And the tree is, is planted here. But I, I also see, and this is my analogy, this isn't, um, Jesus didn't say this, okay? But this is, this is the picture that, that I have. Jesus did talk about trees a lot, though, so I'm not way off on, on this. But um, I think the le that we, all of us in this room, are like leaves. That, that our job is to, to personally soak up as much of the sun as we can as we're reaching out from the tree into our community. Now, some of those branches are close by. Some of them are in the school systems here. Some of them are in, in jobs and families and, and everything here in this community. But a healthy tree reaches out even beyond the trunk. Okay, a healthy tree is always growing and always trying to reach a little bit further and a little bit further. And then at the very far reaches of the tree are some really weird leaves called missionaries. Um, and we are your missionaries, okay? So we are some of the weird leaves at the very end of the tree. And the reason I say we're weird is because we're actually connected to two trees. We're connected to you here, but we're also connected to a tree in Albania. And one of the things that we hope today is that as we have soaked up sun in Albania and as we are a part of that tree, that we can encourage you and that the, the sugars that you get to this morning can be an encouragement that, that the, 
this tree, this church bears more fruit right here. But I can tell you that your being a part of us has encouraged and is bearing fruit there too. So this morning we're here just to share about that. We're, sh we're going to share about some of that extra starch, so to speak, that, that is being produced as we've been connected together. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? This is a familiar passage. I'm sure um, you've heard sermons from this pulpit on, on this passage. Um, the, the people of the day started, or the disciples started giving answers that the people of the day gave. Well, maybe, maybe a prophet, maybe, maybe even John the Baptist reincarnated. Um, interestingly enough, that's the type of answer that an Albanian would give. Who is Jesus? Who is this man Jesus? They would say, eh, he may have been a prophet. He, they gave sort of the same answers that were prevalent on the day when Jesus was here. But then Jesus turned the question around to his disciples and said, okay, that's what they say I am. Who do you say I am? Peter quickly spoke up and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus praised Peter for this spirit-inspired answer and said, On the rock of this truth, I will build my church, and even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, if you consider it, gates are not offensive weapons. They're defensive. It's because it's the kingdom of God that is advancing. Maybe you are like me, and maybe this is the picture of the gates of hell that you have, have in your mind. I remember when I first heard the, this passage spoken on, I, I sort of thought, why not just keep the gates closed? <laughs> Let's keep Satan in there and, and keep the gates of hell closed. But I, I soon realized that the gates of hell were not gates to keep me out. They were more like gates of a pr prison keeping the lost in. And so Jesus went on to say in the next verse, in verse 19, oh, go, ahead, go ahead to the next one. Okay, um, for some reason the slide got uh, deleted, so I'm sorry, I'll just say it. Um, in verse 19 he said, um, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and what you uh, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And today I want to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about keys. And I think the gates of hell that hold, have held people in for so long in Albania don't look like the, the fiery gate I just showed you. They look more like these things. They look more like, go ahead, more like Islam. The, the fact that an Albanian just being born in Albania considers themselves born into Islam. And that's a trap for them. Fear. Um, Islam actually is ruled by fear. That's how the religion rules the people, but they live in fear. Whether they are practicing Muslims or not, they live lives of fear. They also are fatalistic. I'm born of a villager, I'll always be a villager. I'm born this way, and there's no way to change. And so that's, that's a trap, that's a lie of Satan. They can't change, they cannot become more like Christ, like we would say. They, they're, they're stuck in the way they are. And the last one I'm gonna just mention is shame. Albania is an honor-shame culture, and some of the questions we might feel that the afterwards might dive into that a little bit more. But we see things as right and wrong, and so we say that lying is sin. They say, no, it's honor, shame. And so lying is okay as long as it's bringing on, is not shaming someone. Okay, so it's actually the right thing to do to lie. It's the right thing to do to steal if, you're bringing, if you are honoring your family. The only way it turns wrong is if it becomes a dishonor and shame. And so it's very interesting and, and difficult as, as we're sharing the gospel, that's a lie of Satan that they, he's put in front of them. But even the, the most disappointing, the, the, the thing that grabs our heart the most is that in Albania there's less than 1% evangelical Christians. And so many, many people have yet to hear the gospel, even for the first time, have yet to hear the name of Jesus. We'll, we'll share about a village where we got to just this past year do that for the first time.
Next. There's the verse. <laughs> I got it mixed up on there. Um, we'll, we'll just go on. In Albania, we say the person who holds the keys holds the power. That means even the most powerful judge in the city is held captive to the night guard who has the key to the courthouse. And the same is true in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus has given you and I the means to grant those who are waiting to enter access. There, in one way, every key is the same. It's forged with that truth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what Albanians need to hear. But not just Albanians, that's what people here in Vermont need to hear. That Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the key. But I think in another way, and um, again, in an analogy, sort of like we, we did with the trees, I, I think every, tr every key is a little bit different. And God has given each of us keys of ways to reach into our community. In 1993, um, my father, David Van Roman, was invited to share his expertise in agriculture in a tiny Balkan country that he had never heard of before. Now, 24 years later, my mom and my dad oversee ministry in three different Albanian communities, reaching a second generation with the gospel of Christ. But farming isn't our skill set. When we first moved to the village of Alashai, God used Silas photography as a key to get into the homes of many people in the village. It was literally a key to open doors. Um, we, we went in and we visited. We had coffee with our friends and our neighbors. We heard their life stories. We asked for prayer requests. And then um, ultimately, we gave them a portrait and, and paired them with a prayer partner here in America, and several in this, this room were par prayer partners. If you look closely, you may recognize the Bensons there in the middle. They were the prayer partners for, for this family. This past term, Nathan has used, um, has continued to use uh, his experience in education and in discipleship, um, and working with a group of youth in our village in teaching them inductive Bible study methods. Every week, they study a portion of scripture, and they um, observe, they interpret, and they discuss how they can apply God's truth to their lives. It's a tremendous joy to see the light bulbs go off in their mind as they understand what the Bible has to say for them personally. Um, I want to sh have Nathan share a story with you about a particular Bible study that happened last November and one of the youth that was touched. This is Luli. Um, I see some smiling faces and nodding heads that, that uh, his face actually looks a little familiar to some of you. Luli is a bit different though, okay? In, in Albania, most people are fairly short. They have dark hair, dark eyes. Um, Luli is fairly tall. He has blonde hair and, bl and blue eyes. In, in our village of Alashai, most of the people in the village have lived there for generations, sort of like Vermonters. They, they um, have lived for generation upon generation. And yet, Luli's a little bit different. He's a transplant. His family has moved into Alashai more recently. And he's moved in from the, the mountainous north, which got him the nickname Malak. Malak means hick, redneck. Um, it sort of almost means hillbilly. hillbilly. Um, it, it has the implication, it's not a, put it this way, it's not a compliment. Um, and uh, I can tell you that it started lots of fights. In fact, I met Luli breaking up a fight. That's, that's how I got to know him the first time. Thankfully now, he lets it roll off his, his back a lot more. Um, he, he does a lot better with that. If you had asked Luli about a year ago, he would have said that he was a Christian. And the reason he would say that is he had studied the Quran. And he was studying the Bible, and he was coming to church, and the Bible made more sense to him. It, it, he, he, he understood it, and it made more sense. But he had never made a decision to follow Christ. And so um, I continued to pour into Luli. He continued to be there any time the, the gates of the center were open. I think he probably, as the strange one, he was att attracted to the really strange one. The guy who came into the village way as an outsider couldn't even speak the language fully when we arrived. And so anyway, Luli and I connected on a, on a very tight manner. 
Last November, we were getting to the end of studying um, a, a certain topic in our Bible study, and I said, what would you like to study next? What, I asked the group, and someone said, could you teach us how to evangelize? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you know missionaries, but that, that's like throwing red meat to us. Of course, we'll teach you how to evangelize. That's awesome. Uh, we were, I was excited to do that. And so the next week, I decided I would start sort of simply with the four spiritual laws. And I gave them each a notebook, and we started through. I was drawing up on the board. Um, we were going through scripture. Uh, if you're not familiar with the four spiritual laws, they're, they're pretty simple. Law number one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. And law number two, uh, sin has separated us from God. It's put a chasm between us and God's plan and, and what he wants for us. Rule, or law number three is that it's only through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that, that we can bridge that gap, that we can, can get from the, uh, bridge the chasm that separates us. And then law number four is that you need to personally decide to accept that gift. Well, I saw Luli taking notes. I saw him really getting into this. He was highlighting scripture in the Bible. And, and we got to law four, and I could just tell it was, it was heavy on him. So I, I just asked generally, I said, has anyone here believed laws one through three, but has never had a chance or never taken the opportunity for law four? I used the illustration of Jesus knocking at the door, Revelations 3.20 even pulled out a picture on my phone of the, the famous uh, piece of art that I'm sure you're all familiar with of, of Jesus knocking at, at a, a, the heart's door. And there's no doorknob on that art. If you look at it, there's no way that Jesus, of course there is a way Jesus could come in. He's God. But, but Jesus is a gentleman. He's waiting for it to be open from the inside. And so I shared that with him. And I said, would anyone like to take step four today? And Luli did this. Both hands, almost an I surrender moment. Um, and I said, oh, that's awesome. Would you be willing to pray now in front of your peers and, and pray to ask Jesus into your heart? He gave one of the most amazing, simple sinner's prayer that I have ever heard. In my heart, I was rejoicing with the angels in heaven. Now Luli's strange even in another way. <laughs> because he's a new creation. His teachers have wondered, where did this student come from? He didn't care about school at all. Why did he wait till the last semester of his senior year to get serious about schooling? His parents probably think the same thing. I'm not sure. Um, he he he's, has tons of joy, always happy. Um, he is reading the Bible that I gave him, but he doesn't just read it. He goes home and he reads it out loud. He tells his family that he needs to read it out loud because he understands it more, but he's confided in me that he can read it quietly, that's fine. He just wants them to hear. And so he's read through the entire New Testament, and he was halfway through the Old Testament when we came back in May. The other thing that Luli wanted to do is be baptized. In Albania, that's a pretty important step, um, not because it's salvation, and we were clear to, to make, make that clear to those in the church, but in a country where you are born a Muslim, it's the act of baptism that tells everybody, I am now converted to Christianity. So it's a very powerful symbol in Albania, probably even more powerful than here in the States. And so Luli wanted to, to do that, and he wanted to do it immediately. But we had two problems. Our baptisms are in the Adriatic Sea, and it was November. And so I said, Luli, can you wait till May? Can we wait till right before we come back to the States? I promise before we come back, we'll, we'll have a baptismal service. And so we did, and on May 7th, we had a baptismal service. And I have, I made a little highlights video. Um, I'm, we're gonna show here in a minute. Um, I would, in, would have invited you there, but it's way too cold. You're not dressed warm enough, okay? It was, even May 7th, it was pretty cold. You'll see how windy it is. Um, see if you can pick out Luli. I don't think it'll be too hard.
That's your fruit. That's some of that extra starch. We consider ourselves as your ministry partners in Albania. And so this fruit's hanging from your tree. Thank you for being a part of it. All six of those people have stories that I, we wish we could tell. Over the last couple of years, we've hosted teams and volunteers in Albania who have used their skills, their interests, their passions, their experiences in a variety of ways like chess, nursing, child development, agriculture, home repair, baking, sewing, and crafting to open doors of invitation to the kingdom of God. Our daughter Ellie uses her guitar each week at church um, and at Kids Club to accompany our singing. And Rennie has even shared his Legos with some friends that we minister to every other week at a group home for orphans. But sometimes keys aren't something that we even carry. They're mailed to us. And in one example of that, our Christmas shoe boxes. Are you guys familiar with Samaritan's Purse? Okay, good, good. You may not have heard the story of what happens after they're sent from here. So um, be encouraged that uh, while not every box in it, it has the same story, God is using them. Um, as a side note on this, out in our, on the table, we have a place that you can sign up for a newsletter um, or to stay in touch with us. And one place is uh, just to, to tell you how to get on our secret Facebook group. Last Christmas, we did a live video um, of us handing out these shoe boxes. And so people in the States were able to sort of go along with us in, in handing out, out the boxes. So if you're interested in that, if you're on Facebook and want to connect, um, talk with us after the service for that. I'm going to share a brief story about what happened as a result of sharing those shoe boxes um, a year and a half ago. Uh, we work together with the superintendent from our local school. It represents four or five different villages that all feed into one grade school. And each year he gives us a list of the number of boys and girls and the breakdown of ages so that we can be sure to have the appropriate number of boxes. Well, this was a year and a half ago. He um, approached us at the meeting and said, would you have enough boxes to go to the individual village kindergartens? Uh, because we'd never done that before. And we said, sure, we would love to see those kids. And so we gathered the boxes necessary and visited each of these little kindergartens. And in the course of doing so, we visited the village of Mittal, which as I've said, it's in our school district, so it's not far away. But because it's located off a gravel road that goes nowhere else, we never had the opportunity to visit. And in the course of visiting to hand out these boxes, we discovered that this village didn't even have a mosque. There was no work going on religiously in this community. And so we felt like it might be the next place that we could start um, kingdom work. So we met with the village mayor and asked if we could get his permission to start a children's club in his community. And much to our surprise, he said, 
absolutely yes. We know what you are doing in Vlashai, and we would love for you to do that in Matal. So three months later, in coordination with a team from Asbury University, we kicked off a kids club. We um, went to the village, we had flyers to hand out door to door, and let everybody know that on Saturday we would be meeting on the grounds of the old abandoned school with a program. Unfortunately, the day we were to canvas the neighborhood, it poured rain, and we handed out four invitations. We were a little discouraged, to say the least, so, but we said, we will be faithful, we will go, maybe word will get out, and if we have a handful of kids, we'll count it as success. So Saturday arrived, and it was a little overcast, but it was dry, and as we pulled up to the village, um, a little boy ran across the dirt road in front of us, and we said, yay, we've got one kid. But as we pulled up into the driveway of the school grounds, kids just started pouring out of the trees, and we had, at the end of our meeting, over 80 kids and adults, some parents came too, just to see what all the excitement was about. We had tasked our friend Ada to um, give the Bible lesson for our first meeting. Now Ada was about eight or nine years old when she accepted Jesus into her heart, and she was the first Christian in our village. Now she's in her early 20s and a vibrant believer. She had just finished her first year of Bible school and is um, one of the leaders of our little church. So after we had gotten all the kids calmed down um, and quiet, she opened with a question. And she asked these children, where do we come from? Well, the kids immediately got all excited again and didn't even wait to be called on. They started shouting, monkeys, monkeys, we come from monkeys. <laughs> And Ada said, no, you were created by God, and we are going to tell you about him. That was in May of 2016, and every Saturday since then, we have continued to meet with children from the village of Mittal, sharing with him the stories of the Bible, starting in the Old Testament and working our way up to introducing Jesus last Christmas. We no longer meet outside that school. God has provided a, a village house that we meet in. Has no electricity, no running water, but it keeps the rain off our heads. And so we're happy about that. It's also, we can close it off and, and heat it a little bit. Um, we still average about 30 students, or 30 kids that come each week. And as we shared, starting with the story of creation and, and the stories of the Old Testament, when we got to Christmas, we were able to introduce Jesus for the first time. We spent from Christmas to Easter talking about Jesus, his ministry, his teachings, and we're able then to talk about his death and resurrection at Easter time. And at the week after Easter, we, we presented the wordless book um, with, the, with the colored bracelets and um, three, three of the girls accepted Christ um, from uh, nothing, no knowledge at all, not even who Jesus was, to, to coming to faith in Christ. These girls were working on discipling further as well as continuing to present the gospel um, there in the village. On top of that, it's exciting that the very group that I mentioned before, that discipleship group that I work with and, and do inductive Bible study, they are the ones who've caught in the vision for Matal. And so what we do, what Seidel and I do now, is we work to equip them, we make sure they have curriculum if they need it or, or those types of things, and then we let them run with it. And all we do is drive them. Uh, encourage them, drive them, make sure they're, they're ready to go. And it is people like Luli and people like Ada that are sharing the gospel there in Matal. And so our first fruits are now bearing fruit. And that, that is so exciting. Men, however, continue to be the hardest demographic for us to reach whether it's pride or their generations of um, Islam in their lives, uh, they have a hard time stepping foot through the gates to our ministry center that has earned the nickname the Jesus Place. But we believe that the key to reaching these men is shaped like a soccer ball. When we return to Albania this fall, we hope to begin construction on a 
Next so, slide. Next slide. On the indoor soccer field, the lower level of that soccer field of the orange building you see there will house the business side of the, the soccer field and we'll be able to rent it in the evenings um, for league play. And so it will be something that will be not just self-sufficient for itself as a business, but it will also fund the ministry of the church. Um, in a way that only God could do it, he has, has put on our heart a way that, that we can reach men and have them pay us to do it. And so we're sort of excited ab about that. The top floor will be a new meeting space, a larger meeting space. Our church has outgrown the little space that many of you have been in um, there in Albania. And so we need a bigger space. And so on the top floor of the soccer field will, will be that space. We believe that this will not just reach the men in our community, but it will attract men from the surrounding region as well. And so we really see that this is the key that God's put in our, our hands to use for this next phase of ministry. As Nathan said, this is a proven business model that we have seen in Albania. Um, dependence on finances from the United States is not in the long-term best interest of our village church. Our plan is to use this facility as a revenue stream to underwrite the, the ministry expenses, which is still heavily dependent on the min, um, Planter Seed Foundation, the ministry my parents started more than 20 years ago. And while we hope that my parents have many more years ahead of them, we um, see this facility as a legacy to continue the work they started beyond their ability to fund it. We do believe that it will provide jobs in our community too, not just for the few jobs that the soccer field will create, but also for businesses that will pop up around it. Um, some of you might remember Barthi, who sells the bread next to our village. He doesn't even have enough money to buy the, the appropriate receipt machine that is required by government right now to, to sell his bread. And so he's working under the table, sort of on the black market. but. If people start coming and he can start selling um, sodas and, and waters and, and energy drinks to those who are coming, he will be able, his business will be able to thrive as well. We also see this as a way to reach out to the women in our community. In Velashai, in the village, um, as was mentioned before, as Pastor mentioned, um, there's some ministry in the city, and the city is, very, is a lot more cosmopolitan, closer culturally to us in the states. But in the village, there's still a lot of, chain, a lot of things that are different. And one is that women are, after the age of 12, it's really not appropriate for them to go and play or do any activity, to go jogging, to ride a bike, anything like that. And so one day a week, we want to leave the soccer field as women only. It'll be run by and staffed by women that day, and it'll only have women um, playing in leagues and things for that day so that they would be able to have an outlet and we'd be able actually to reach women as well. And then the last one Seidel just mentioned before is we do see this as a legacy piece that for David and Sarah as they, um, as they are sort of closing their chapter uh, of their work in Albania. We're continuing on, but this could be a really good final um, chapter for them. Currently, we're about 40, we have about $47,000 raised of the 100,000. So we have about $53,000 left to raise. So maybe um, if you are excited in th this idea of soccer um, and the key of that in our village is resonating with you, maybe you would like to join us in helping get this key to Albania. Um, our son came up with a, I thought it was a pretty brilliant little marketing idea, <laughs> um, of a key ring with a soccer ball. It's, it's red and black because those are Albania's soccer team colors. If you're interested in praying, if you will be praying for us in the soccer key or interested in getting more information on our table, pick up one of these keys. There's a little piece of paper, uh, a key rings. Um, pick up that and there's a little piece of paper that tells you how you can get more involved. While God has called us to Albania, what keys has he given you? What talents, what skills, what interests, what relationships do you have that God could use to unlock the kingdom of heaven for the lost within your sphere of influence? Your continued prayers and financial support are crucial keys for getting us back to Albania and continuing the work that God has called us to. 
As I mentioned more than one time al already, there, we have a table in the back in ways that you can connect with us so that it's not just every four years you're hearing from us, but you're hearing from us a lot more regularly. Um, I've talked to a couple this morning that said that, that they enjoy hearing what God's doing in Albania through our e-newsletters, through our Facebook group. And so if you're not a part of that and you would like to be, please connect with us in the back of the table. Well, that concludes our report, our formal report, and we. But I, oh. I think we're going to have time for answer, you know, question questions and answers. So. Yeah, let's bring the chairs up. Where's your, okay, I'm gonna go down here for a minute. So thank you for the presentation. Um, what I'd like to see is if uh, you have a question you'd like to ask them about their culture, about their ministry, what would you like to ask Nathan and Seidel? Anybody have a question? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jacob. I wanted to ask you about the price that it has cost you to do the mission work over there. It's something that I'm kind of curious about because you said the culture has an Islamic influence, right? So isn't there a, maybe a degree of persecution that happens in these places? Or even for you guys, for them, anything like that? Uh, yes, um, it's not the same as what you see on the news on ISIS and things. Albania is a, would be considered a secular Muslim country. Um, in fact, last year the government uh, tried five clerics that had been recruiting for ISIS and sentenced them from 15 years to 30 years. Um, all five clerics were, were sentenced. So they, they are try to push away that type of persecution, but there definitely is family persecution. Um, th there are, it's, it's common for a family not to, uh, someone to accept Christ and then not be married, not, not have con their connections. It's not what you know, it's who you know in Albania. And so um, if your uncle won't vouch for you anymore because you become a Christian, that's, that can really hamper uh, your, you're going forward, so it can cost. That's for the people of the, the church. Um. We, Ada, who I told you about, who is sharing in, um, in Matal, who is our, our teacher there now, uh, this spring, an individual in our community waited until her parents had left her work, went to her house, and proceeded to curse her um, because she would not promise to celebrate Ramadan. She says, I'm, I'm a Christian, I don't celebrate that. And, um, and in Albanian culture, that's the worst thing you can do. They have a whole case in their language for cursing people because they are such a superstitious um, culture that that's what they do. They will pay um, the imam to come and curse people that they have a grudge against, but they really um, do try to socially isolate people who don't conform. Who else? By the way, for those of you who are saying, where is Albania? I'm sure there's people who just like, where is Albania? The simplest way to describe that is you think of the Mediterranean Sea. It's in the northeast quadrant. You know where Greece is. It sits on top of Greece. Or another way to put it, if the, if the country of Italy is a boot, if it kicks back, it kicks into Italy. Albania, I mean. Yes. So that's the simplest way, correct? Right. Okay, that's the simplest way, so hope that helps. Who else has a question? Uh, can I add one more thing? You asked what it was costing us, and I, for the most part, we, we absolutely love living in Albania and being called to serve there. That is just... Um, we, we feel like this is, God has created us for this, and it's a wonderful privilege, but as our parents age, we feel that, that difficulty that we can't be back home to help with our parents. The day we were flying to Albania to serve our first term, Nathan's mother had a massive stroke and almost lost her life. 
Um, and then she had a subsequent stroke three months later and is immobile and nonverbal. And it's really hard to see Nathan's dad carry the brunt of her care by himself. And so those are personal costs that, that we, sh we bear. Okay, so I got a question. So what are, how are Albanians like Americans and how are Albanians different than Americans? Albanians really long to be seen as European, and so on the surface, they dress more European, um, and they really pride themselves on if they've been able to leave and, and, and just have a knowledge of, of a very a wide set of things. However, having been under Islamic rule for more than 400 years, as Nathan alluded to at the beginning, it's an honor and shame culture, and so many of the motivations, many of the responses to certain situations really blindside us because it's coming from a point of view that we hadn't considered before. And in an honor-shame culture, sin is not what you've done, it's who you are. And so as students of the culture, we are constantly trying to look for ways to present the gospel in ways that will resonate with them and in their heart. And I'll have Nathan share a couple of examples of, from scripture. Well, for us, for an American where rules, it's right and wrong, um, 1 John 1, 9 is a very popular verse that we would use if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's a, um, a powerful scripture um, to us. But to an Albanian, that doesn't really resonate very much because they don't see sin as what you do. or And even the confession doesn't right, doesn't right the wrong because in an honor-shame culture, the person who is shamed is not able to raise themselves up. Only someone greater than them can honor you and lift them out. So verses like, I know you by name, before the foundations of the earth, I knew you, called you by name, and I have, I have chosen you, those verses are, resonate in, in ways that they don't necessarily to me, but to them, wow, the God of the universe honors me, he knows my name. Well, that, that is a, a totally different way of sharing the gospel, and, but starting at that point, um, and we're, we're finding that um, they look a lot the same, and we think that they're very similar to the U.S., um, and in some ways, they've watched enough movies and media to, to parrot the right things to make them seem very American. Uh, or very Western, but their thought process, their whole, the, the, their whole culture is not. Um, and so we had a friend that came from the Middle East who had been serving um, in, in some closed areas of the Middle East, and he said he's had worse culture shock in Albania because he, he's acting like they are thinking the same way he is because they dress sort of alike, they do some of the same language, but they're really still, he said it was easier for him to realize that um, someone who is an Arab in, an, in the Middle East is going to think differently. But when someone's dressed like you, looks like you, talks like you, maybe even speaks English, thinks totally differently, that, that slapped him on the side of the head a lot. I'm a language teacher, and I remember a few years ago when you guys visited, you were talking about the, the process of learning the language. You were taking classes at that point. Can you talk about your experience with the language and, you know, upon arriving and how that has evolved in your language acquisition? And then the second question I have is, can you talk about just the kids and what the Albania life is like for kids and maybe teenagers? I'll, I'll do the language, she'll do the kids thing. Um, Albanian is a difficult language, and we sort of knew that going in, but we didn't realize how difficult, and I'm glad we didn't. When we were here last, I'm glad we were going in a little bit um, naive. Uh, like the word cup, for instance, there's 20 forms of every noun. Um, and so depending on where, it, if it's used as a subject, if it's used as a direct object, the, the noun changes. And so um, it, it's difficult. The grammar is very difficult. Uh, more recently, there has been some studies that have 
put out the Albanian language as one of the three oldest languages in the world still spoken. So even older than Greek, even older than Hebrew. And um, if that's the case, I think that it was probably created at the Tower of Babel to confuse people. So um, on, on the flip side though, we studied for about a year, um, about nine months actually, our, during our first year formally. We took about a year off and then we went back for another semester of study, another four months or so. Um, and we now every week go and we have a conversation group, um, or not even a group, we, have a, we hire a um, teacher to, to speak with us. And um, we are probably conversational at this point, we're not fluent. Um, I can understand a lot, if not not 100%, but very close to that. Seidel speaks better than me, though, and I don't know, we, we haven't figured out where that comes, but if we're together, I will interpret what has just happened and she will respond. Um, and so, if we're together, we're in good shape. If not, uh, th it's a little bit more challenging. Okay, and your second question was, what's it like for kids and youth? Um, and I can just speak from our village. Um, our village is, you know, rural, and so we have a lot of um, parents in our community who are unskilled. What that means is that a lot of the dads leave for several months at a time and find work in Greece or in Italy in agriculture, whether working in olive groves or, or whatnot. And then mom will go find a job at the Italian shoe factory or one of the local textile factories. And so that means that the kids are home alone all day um, with very little supervision. And so a lot of what Nathan does, bless his heart, is he has our center open every afternoon after school for the kids to come. Um, Ada has started doing after school tutoring with them. And so we're trying to help them see, okay, you, I know you're born a villager, but just apply yourself, study hard, and you can open doors of opportunity for yourself in the future so you don't have to follow the same path as your parents. But Albania is, um, if, to use a missiological term, I think, it's a high power distance culture. We are a low power distance culture. As Americans, we are enabling our children as young as possible how to tie their shoes, how to feed themselves, how to get dressed alone by themselves, how to take care of things and be independent. Albania, it's the opposite. And so what that means is that they, are, they don't have high expectations for their children. They're not giving them chores to do. They're not... Um, they, they don't even really care that they come to our programs because they're not capable of making decisions for themselves. They're not until they reach adulthood. So in one respect, that works to our advantage. But um, it's also frustrating because um, the kids don't really respond to, you know, d the discipline is not part of their everyday experience. Were you asking for our kids, though? Or were you asking for kids in general? Okay. Okay, um, for our kids, the challenge is a friend. Um, we homeschool them because they, um, our son has physical challenges that would make it very difficult for public school because their bathrooms especially are basically outhouses. Um, and then our, our daughter has more educational challenges. And so homeschooling is the best for us right now. We have a teacher, though, that is a missionary colleague that comes and teaches four days a week. And so we have almost an in, in-house tutor. It works really well for them. The challenge, though, is friends. And so they have really loved being here in the States. Whereas we've been traveling around, um, their first question is, okay, where we're we going next, do they have kids? And the second one is, do the kids speak English? And so um, they finally learned, the, they don't ask that second question anymore because they figured out now that everywhere we're traveling in the States, everyone speaks English. It's really a cool thing. Um, but uh, that, that's a challenge for them. They do play with the kids in the village, but there's a lot of misunderstandings because of their, their language level as well as um, the village kids, most of them don't speak any English or, or maybe just a, hello, how are you, what's your name? Um, I know Rennie, our son, has gotten really frustrated with every day answering the question, what is your name? Because that's the only English that the village kids know to ask him. And so um, they are trying to be friendly. They're really, but he's like, you know my name. <laughs> 
Rennie actually went to a kindergarten in Albania and, and did, a, did a pretty good job there at that kindergarten. But the, the thing we realized about halfway through the year, it was even, I guess, later, yeah, March, you're right. So it was three quarters of the way through the year. Um, we said, why aren't you trying to absorb more of this Albanian language? And he said, I don't want to learn Albanian. I don't want to learn sheep is the, the name of the language. Um, because then I won't be an American anymore. And we said, Randy, that's not the case at all. You can ha it's best if you can be bilingual, if you can know both languages. So he started applying himself near the end of the year. He actually understands a fair amount. We, we catch him playing chess with the boys and stuff like that. Um, and, and so he understands a, f a fair amount. And our daughter, Ellie, has a real heart to learn. And she really un is picking it up quickly too, but because they're homeschooled, because the schooling's in English, they're not fluent either. Thanks. Well, in honor of, the, of our time here, um, there's going to be, if you have other questions, they're going to be out in our cafe, and they will, uh, you can interact with them and meet their kids, that kind of thing. Uh, so that'll be right outside after the service here. The last question I would have is, we have a lot of people here, and we do a lot of mission trips, service projects, things like that. What, what would you say to somebody who says, is it worthwhile to go to another culture to just to see it and be involved in it and share Jesus? What, what would you tell them? Would, should they or should they not? The answer to that in a short version is yes, please come. It, it, um, there are lots of reasons for that. I, I can tell you that we do not view teams as workhorses to paint another wall somewhere. Um, we plug you in in a relational way and help knock down more doors. And so, for instance, the Asbury team that came last May, they were the ones that opened the door for this village ministry in Matal that is continuing today. And so that team was only there for a week and a half. Um, they only got to know the kids by name. They only got selfies with the kids, got, maybe became Facebook friends, and then they, they left. But the impact of what they did is still being felt today in Albania. But it's not just being felt today in Albania for Albanians. It's being felt today by the team that was there. We just met, we were down at Asbury two weeks ago and met with some of the ones that were on that team, and they're just, they, they just say, I can't get Albania out of my mind. I keep praying for Albania, I, you know, and so there, it is mutually beneficial. Um, it's one of those places where I really think that um, the, the leaves analogy, um, the job of the leaves is to get the energy from the sun and bring it back to the church, and uh, short-term mission trips do that. They get, they get the leaves out where there's the sun, where, where God's at work, and bring them back and, get, and you're able to tell stories and share something that's, that's even bigger. Okay, let's uh, close in prayer and thank you for uh, your interaction here. Father, we just thank you for Nathan Seidel and, and the being here this morning to talk to us about what it's like to be overseas, what it's like to influence another culture and actually be influenced by that culture. We pray that as we continue that we can hear and see God at work in our lives as well. And may we be obedient to the promptings of God. We love you. We trust you. And we pray for them as they uh, gain support to go back to Albania, that this soccer place would be a place of opportunity, a place that is a crossover to them where they can connect with people in the culture and influence for Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name.